presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Were you ever criticized because Frank says Negro? All the time. Oh, okay. All the time. Do I care? No. Because people say that. Coming up next on Dialogue, a frank conversation with Pulitzer Prize winning author Richard Ford about language, about love, and about life in America. That's Dialogue, Conversations That Matter. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. My greatest human flaw and strength, says the character Frank Bascom, is that I can always imagine anything, a conversation, a government, as being different from how it is. Bascom might well be describing a quality central to his own creator, writer Richard Ford, who's imagined Bascom's life in four novels about the fictional realtor from New Jersey. Known for his attention to the rhythms of language, Ford won a Pulitzer for one of the Bascom books, Independence Day, and he was nominated for another Pulitzer for the most recent addition to the series, Let Me Be Frank With You. The author of several other novels, including Wildlife and Canada, Ford has also penned short stories, including those in the book Rock Springs. I sat down with him at the 2015 Sun Valley Writers Conference for a free-ranging discussion about his work and about American life. Welcome, welcome to Idaho. I assume you've Thank been you. here quite a few times. Lots of times. Been to Idaho lots of times. Um, a, a, a lot of times when I was fishing, when I used to fish, we'd fish on the river ranch over in uh, uh, close to the mountains. And um, then to Boise. And then a, a quite a, when I lived in Montana, went to the uh, Panhandle a lot of times. I've been down in the Palouse. I've, I've been well, I guess the Palouse is not officially in Idaho, but it's close. Oh, yeah, it's, yeah near Moscow, do, the do, Moscow do, do, do Park. They consider that? Mm -hmm. yeah, Absolutely. Been, so I've been all over, actually. You have. For a boy from Mississippi, that's unusual. Well, how come we don't have any books about Idaho from you? We, Boise made a few appearances, I noticed. Uh, Once in a while. Somebody had an illicit lover in yes. Boise, Idaho. It's always re it always represents you know the camp farthest out. <laughs> <laughs> the secrets. Well, it's a really nice place, though. I've been there several times. It's, uh, you know, so it's always e e easy to run a place down when you've never been there. Well, Montana certainly features yeah, in, in your books. And I, I, I have to say, I, I think my favorite work of yours is Wildlife. Thank you. Well, you know, that was the book when it was published that was like my palsied child. Um, nobody liked it very much. Why? Treated it mean. So, of course, I was the most protective and defensive about it. You know, Marcia, I don't know. It was a good book, but uh, every book has its moment in the eyes of its critics. And I think maybe, and I'm just guessing, because since I said I don't know, I really don't, uh, I thought maybe that they expected me to write something else from what I did write. So when I wrote what I wrote, that didn't set well. Well, I think it's, it's a wonderful story. It's almost like a novella, in a way. I mean, it's a it, novel. It, it, but yeah, it's it, a little short novel. It's a short novel. The great American novel is the great short novel, I think. Yeah. It's not the big... Um, Tomesson, Ken Kesey, you know, giant book of the Northwest. It's a little book like The Great Gatsby or So Long See You Tomorrow. That, that to me, is, is, is a greater achievement. Anybody can go long, but the middle distance is a little tough. You ask any, any track boy, they'll tell you that the middle distance is the tough one. Well, it's set in Great Falls, as is yes. Canada. And I've seen you call... Uh, Great Falls, a triggering town for you. And I was just borrowing that from Dick Hugo. Richard Hugo has a wonderful little lecture which he made into an essay, and the lecture is called The Triggering Town. And in essence, what Hugo said was that uh, writing about your own hometown, mine being Jackson, Mississippi, will turn out to be, for an imaginative writer, a poet, a novelist, harder because those things have a kind of permanence that, is, that are hard for you to change. And when you're writing a piece of imaginative literature, some story, you need to be able to sort of change it and mutate it and alter it to, in terms of what you find out about it, in terms of what you find yourself able to do and not to do, and then change it in that way. So a place you didn't know about. And I started writing about Great Falls in the 80s when I had never even been there. Um, it was easy to do. Um, it just was lucky because when I ultimately did go to Great Falls and was able to 
be there and live there. Uh, I loved it, and it didn't get more difficult to write about. It got easier to write about. What's well, a fabulous name, Great Falls? Well, well, that's it, isn't it? I mean, to me, I think that was what made me write about it because whenever I would see the Great Falls on the page, my heart would leap. I would think, "Ooh, good! I'm glad I was able to write a story that has that word in it, that name." You know, because you can say it, you can say it as an "I am," or you can say it as a "trochee." You can say Great Falls or Great Falls. And it also has this sort of picture in it of something going Great down. Great and falling yeah, at the going same down, time. Something going down. <laughs> yeah. And vis a vis that, it seems uh, that many of your stories, many of your books deal with that threshold of between greatness and falling. Yes. Uh, maybe I'll get this incorrect, but a liminal moment, you know, yeah. in between. Yeah. two things <coughs> I think that's uh, right. where you can take one path this way or the other and, yeah uh, yeah but that's that's sort of natively dramatic isn't it I mean that, that a person could either do this or do that uh, things could go bad or things could go good depending on yourself and so that puts a lot of pressure on characters and on individual cons you know constitutions and so that, that interests me uh, and I'm sure it came to some extent from my own past. I was a, 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 a budding young criminal when I was young, and I was able to pull myself back from that brink through my mother and my father's help. And, uh, and, and I, but I could taste it, and I still have a little bit of an appetite for it. You know, I, it's almost never that I walk into a drugstore that I don't think about stealing something. But, you know, technology is so far ahead of me now, I, I never do it. I never do it. But I, had, I always had that little tingle, you know. Could I get away with something? Sometimes I'll even, in the, in the grocery store at home, I'll put something in my pocket. And then Just to I, and have then that I get, sensation and, and I get of getting to, away with it. And I get to the checkout and I take it out. Yeah. Put it in. So, well, that's good. So we I think want... people are watching me, watching me. Doing that. Well, the, the other uh, threshold moment that you had as a child was when your father passed away and yes. you were present. Yes. for that and he was in your arms he was. and so many of your stories are about young men boys having these moments where they have to grow up fast that's right well when you're 16 you it, it, it's pretty easy for something to happen that would cause you and boy or girl doesn't have to be a boy uh, something could happen that would cause you to grow up fast I mean I think now probably what I think of as 16 being the optimal time for those transitions in the lives of kids now, it takes place at 12 and 13. Um, sex occurs, maturation occurs early, uh, responsibility for oneself occurs earlier than it did when I was young. So, but I think there are moments, there are sort of epical moments in kids' lives when suddenly they have to adapt to something that they hadn't had to adapt to before. And that makes a great story. It can. I mean, Hemingway wrote a really good story about that called My Old Man. And uh, Sherwood Anderson wrote wonderfully about that. Uh, Scott Fitzgerald wrote wonderfully about that. It's a kind of a, uh, you could call it a coming of age story. That's, that, that doesn't really say enough for it. But it is about that moment of transition from a one state to uh, another state. Emerson says in Self-Reliance, he says, power resides in a moment of transition from a prior state to another state. And what, what you get when you write about those moments of transition is you get that release of power. Octavio Paz has a little poem, this fragment of a poem, in which he says, between what I see and what I say, between what I say and what I keep silent, between what I keep silent and what I dream, between what I dream and what I forget is poetry. So poetry Literature resides in these interstices. It's not there. It wasn't there until you put it there. Would that I would have your recall well, <laughs> for things like that. Old That's brains, you know, they have to be good for something. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember my shoe size, of course. So you weren't going to write another Baskin book? No. It's too hard. You might end up in the Mayo Clinic, you said. If I did end up in the Mayo yes. Clinic. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So, uh, as I understand, you did because you decided that the hurricane. 
the hurricane was inspirational f for yeah. you and uh, yeah. you wanted to have him back in the game. Well, I didn't so much want to have him back in the game as much as I wanted to write about the consequences of the hurricane. Christina and I, my wife and I are from New Orleans, and so we had a lot of Hurricane Katrina experience that other than writing a piece for the New York Times, I'd never written about. It just seemed too fresh in a way, I didn't, I, and I didn't know what to write. Um, but then when Katrina came, or rather when Sandy came along, and we were living in New York, we went down to New Jersey, and I went away from our trip down to the shore, sort of my brain teeming with things that, that I could write about, particularly writing about unforeseen, unknown consequences of the hurricane. And I thought, if I were going to do that, how would I do it? What, what would be my instrument? And I thought, well, Frank would be my instrument because it's his stomping grounds there. Frank knows of the shore, and, my, and I have a readership that wants to read about him. So it was somewhat opportunistic on my part, but also somewhat just commonsensical. Uh, he could do this. So I really enjoyed Let Me Be Frank With Thank You. Thank you. It's funny. It made me laugh, and those who know me know I don't laugh you're all not an that easy, You're much. not an easy laugh? I'm not an easy laugh, so thank you. But, but are you a real one when you do it? Absolutely. Okay, well, that's I think there might have even been a snort in there, too. Oh, oh I see. Or, <laughs> okay, oh, good. That's great. That's great. Well, you know, I thought, was, well, this is very serious funny. stuff. It means to be funny, it, but writing about the hurricane yeah. is serious. Dark things happen yeah. to people, and not very many things worth laughing about. And writing about an assisted living place where you're ex-wife is has Parkinson's is serious right, too right but you you wound in the humor tried to because you know the old there's an old there's an old comics maxim which is that if nothing's funny nothing's serious and I need the I light in the that. dark yeah you need the two faces of drama really we're joined at the cerebellum in both of us those those two faces of James has got a wonderful remark in which he says there aren't any themes that are so human as those that, out of the confusion of life, represent the closeness of humor and darkness. He believes that great literature should include both of those things. Well, it certainly did in this case. In, in one of uh, the stories, I think, and it's a novella, so it's four linked four of them. stories. Yeah. The one I think that resonated the most with me was when an African American woman comes back to what turns out to be her natal home, which is now Frank's home, Correct. and wants to look around. And the plot in and of itself is riveting. I won't give it away because viewers should, should read the book. Good. But Thank you. his interior thoughts about her and how he expresses them to her, I think, are equally as interesting. Liberal angst of not wanting to put a foot wrong racially, um, which we always do. I mean, the more careful and the more second-guessing we are when we're in sensitive, you know, situations with people who we would like to be sensitive to, the more insensitive we ultimately stumble upon ourselves and be. So yeah, he he overthinks it, you know. Yeah, it's, it's what liberals do. We, I mean, I'm one. I can I can say that we <laughs> overthink things. Uh, we over constantly. But I mean, I'm on the other hand. Uh, I want to write about race. I want, I want race, particularly race between American whites and American blacks, to be in my stories because I have a lot of accumulated experience growing up in the South and it was experience that I have lived beyond and, um, and I think that I maybe can write something that somebody would feel freed by if, if, they, wrote, if they read what I wrote. Whites, whites get uh, sort of intimidated out of writing about racial issues because uh, in, in a way it does a, a disservice to everybody. It does a disservice to them because they're constantly afraid of putting a foot wrong and being called a racist. And it does a, a, even in a way a worse disservice to African Americans because it makes them have to be the, in charge of race. And they shouldn't have to be in charge of race. It's, it's too big a responsibility. I'm sure they don't want to be. Were you ever criticized because Frank says Negro? All the time. Oh, okay. All the time. Do I care? No. Because people say that. People say that. I mean, I've been in, I've been in auditoriums when, uh, very, very, you know, quite well to do people, both white and black, African Americans and white people would say, that word's offensive to me. I said, well, it's not offensive to me, and I mean no offense by it. It's what Dr. King said. 
I mean, my wife and I have left what little estate we have to the um, United Negro College Fund. It doesn't say the United African American College Fund. It's a word in parlance, but, you know, uh, um, Richard Wright said that, uh, that, that, that the battle over language is really, is really the principal battle, the first battle in racial equality, is the battle over language. What can we say? What can we not say? So we're ruling words out of our, of our vocabulary, which are words not meant to be derogatory. I, I want to rule them in, because there are definitely words that are derogatory, and we know what they are. We don't have to say them. I don't say them. They hurt people. I don't want to do that. You were born in the South. You left the South in part because of this issue we're just talking about. You I did. De decried the racism, at the, and you came back to the South. You've lived in both Mississippi and New Orleans. As you look at race relations now in the South, uh, your assess is it better than better, when you much better, grew much better, much much better. Um, I I, th I think uh, so I was speaking to someone on the phone before I began to talk to you from Brazil, and he said he said to me he said racism seems to be on the rise in the United States. I said no, it's not on the rise in the United States. I said what's on the rise is awareness. Of racism, documentation, documentation, via and 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 I, I think to some extent that the degree to which we are more aware of racism has to do with the media's doc willingness to document it and to dramatize it and, and to citizens. And it has to do with President Obama. Hmm. That, that that President Obama, it's, it's one of the fruits of his presidency is that we have all become more sensitized to our racial a attitudes. And of course, it's it's. It's brought the bad actors out of the woodpile too, you know. It's it's the, 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 they they feel up against it now. That's why we see them so much in, that more than we used to see them. They were always there. Ferguson was always Ferguson, and a thousand other Fergusons in the United States. But we see it now because those bad actors are feeling pressured, which is what should happen. They should feel they should feel reproved. Have you or will you read Harper Lee's Go Set a Watchman? No, I will not. Because I'm from Mississippi. We had Faulkner. We, we don't need Faulkner light. But other people can read it. That's fine. I'm not against it. In, and I'm certainly not against any of this. Uh, but I'm not interested in it either. I mean, uh, I always thought To Kill a Mockingbird was a young adult book. And by the time I was able to read it, I was not a young adult any, anymore. So. Uh, um, but I mean, I, as, other than it's being a kind of a splashy publishing event, it's not a really, for me, a literary event. Your thoughts on, uh, let me be frank with you, after, after you worked uh, so hard on it and it's nominated for a, a Pulitzer. Didn't win. Well, One of my students came running in my office and she, 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 she said to me, she said, something about the Pulitzer Prize, and I said, well, I didn't win, did I? She said, oh, no, you didn't win. I said, well, get out of here then. <laughs> well, who won? Anthony Dare won. And where's he from? I don't know. Boise, Idaho. Oh, is he? Well, good for him. <laughs> well, high fives for Anthony and high fives for the state of Idaho. Oh. I didn't know where he was from. He's at this event, so... Yeah, he is. Get it. I hope I meet him. I'll congratulate him. I'm proud of him. When you write your books, you write by hand. I do. I do. Which... Is I've got nothing else to do. So I, 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 no, <laughs> tapping along wouldn't, wouldn't make them any better. Well, when Frank Bascom thinks, he thinks in long sentences. Yes. Well, Richard writes in long sentences. Is That's why Frank ever, thinks in long sentences. <laughs> <laughs> is it ever, ever hard for your hand to keep up with? No, no. But it's, 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 I, and when I was writing, let me be frank with you, I, I, I did go back and look over those other books. And I thought, you need to write shorter sentences, because uh, your sentences are getting really long in the, in the lay of the land. The sentences are quite long. I was sorry about that. I didn't want them to be that long. They just, I just couldn't make them any shorter. But I tried to make them shorter, and, and let me be frank with you. I'm kind of surprised, because you have said you're mildly dyslexic, I'm kind of surprised that you didn't move to the computer, that perhaps that might have been easier to, to write on, to type it out, and then you can modify it more easily. Um, no, I just never thought about it. I, you know, th there is certain tactile pleasures in yes. just making 
sentences on a piece of paper with a pen. I, I, I kind of like that. And I, I, uh, maybe it's because I'm dyslexic or maybe I'm not very smart, but I, uh, I think slowly. I'm not a rapid fire thinker. So I can, I can, if I typed a lot faster, then I wouldn't necessarily do it any better. I remember I said to Joyce Carol Oates one time, I said, do you, do you have a computer? And she said, oh, she said, do you want me to write more than I do? So I think to myself, I don't need to write more than I do. I mean, I've, I'm 71 years old, I've written 11 books. That's probably eight more than I ever thought I'd write. I mean, it gives you a certain kind of dominion over what you're doing. I mean, I, mean, I do email just like anybody else these days, but how many things would you like to jerk back after you pressed that button, after you whipped it out onto the screen and knocked it off to somebody? And say, Ooh, Jesus, can I please have that back? You know, that doesn't happen when you're inking along the, inking along the line. You mentioned where you and your wife would like to leave your um, estate. Have you thought about where you'd want to leave your papers? You know, your I've given them all to Michigan State where we both, my wife and I, went to university. Yes. Well, mm -hmm. I shouldn't say I gave them all. I sold them all to Michigan State, who were very generous to want to take them. Yeah. You met in the, in the dining room? We did, in, in her dormitory. I was uh, a busboy in her dormitory when she was 17 and I was 19. And we've been married. We've been together for almost 50 years. 50, 50, 51 years, if yeah. you count the four years when we were just boyfriend and girlfriend. Your books are dedicated to her. All of them. Yeah. It always will be. She's yeah. a partner in this. Yes, she is. She allows me to. Well, I mean, she's allowed. She allows me to do everything. I mean, the first time I ever said to her when I had left law school and didn't want to be a lawyer, and she said, "Well, what are you going to do?" I said, mm, "Maybe I'll try to be a writer." I mean, I could have just as easily have said, I'm going to try to be a small engine repairman. And she said, oh, that's good. Do that. She said, that's, that's a great idea. You know, sight unseen, without a thought. She just said, yes, yes, yes. And that, that was as much permission as I, as I needed. And she granted that permission to me. And, uh, if, and there are thousands of other reasons why I would dedicate books to her. But that was the first one. So many authors I interview have that in their lives. They have a spouse or significant other that's made their work possible. Absolutely. I hope they all know it and, and, and acknowledge it. Uh, um, also, my wife uh, wanted to have a career, and she has a PhD and, and has had a wonderful career. We spoke about it earlier. Um, she also made money when I didn't make a penny for a long time. And so just financially, she supported us while I was at home beavering away. We didn't have any children, which made it a little easier. There's some aspects of Sally, your character Frank's next wife, that remind me of what I think Christina must be like. That equanimity and that acceptance of, of Frank. Maybe so. I'd, I'd, I'd just as soon not go there. Yeah, right. <laughs> you want to keep Christ her for yourself. <laughs> Christina used to say, you know, you never write about me. Why, why you never write about me? I said, well, sweetheart, I said, if I, if I could write about you, that meant that I could somehow encircle you. I said, and I don't even want to try to encircle you because it wouldn't do, do, do me any good. I would, you, you could, I would in some way objectify her. And I don't want to, tr I don't want to do that. I don't want to, that's what happens when you, when, when you make someone up, irrespective of what the sources are, you, you, create, a, you create a little verbal object. And, and, and in a way, you, you erase all of its, that verbal object's origins. And um, it just, all of those origins become coalesced into that character. And I don't want to do that where she's concerned. I you, couldn't do it. You, you make me think of how surprised I was that your, uh, that the trilogy now, quadrology or whatever we want to call it, Four. hasn't uh, been turned into TV series. I know that there's been t there was talk about it, but in some ways maybe it's, it's it's too commercial. Or would you be okay with it? I'd be very okay, okay. with it. Sure, go right ahead. Just pay me a boatload of money, and you can do anything you want to with it. You can make a you can make a musical out of it if you if if you want to. Uh, uh, the books are the books. That's what I wrote. What then someone else does with it. Uh, is, is for them a project, and if my books seem to be useful along the way to some, I, I would hope that they would make something that would be worth seeing out of it. Uh, 
mostly that, as you know, doesn't happen with complex books. Uh, just doesn't usually work out that way. But mostly I just want them to pay me a truckload of money. And it's, this is so funny when you say that to people, they seem offended. They, uh, producers come to me and they say, we, we want to make a movie out of these books and we want to make it very faithful to your book. We, we, we want to be, try to make the movie as good as your books. I say, just don't even bother me with that. I don't, I don't care. So why hasn't it been done then? Uh, nobody thought they could do it. Uh, HBO had it for, had three books for a few years and they paid me, they paid me well and then came to the moment when they had to, you know, push the button or not push the button, and they didn't push the button. So probably in the time they had it, they had five changes of CEO and, you know, ten, ten, ten changes of program directors, and so I, and there wasn't much chance ever. I was just hoping that the check would come at the end of the year, and it did. When I finished Let Me Be Frank with you, it did not seem as if Frank wanted to leave the stage yet. Yeah. So, number five. I don't know. Somebody told, somebody said something to me the other day, just out of the blue, um, which, which, this is what happens to me. People say things to me, and I, I'm, one of the qualities of being dyslexic is that I'm a rapt listener. If I don't listen, and really listen carefully, I don't hear anything, so I have to pay attention. So this person said to me, you know, would it be interesting to have Frank take a trip in a mobile home? And the first thing I thought was, well, why would he do that? I would think, well, because his son was stricken. His son Paul would be stricken and have had this wish for himself to take a mobile home trip somewhere. And I thought, wow, that you could almost write a book about that. You should uh, go to Idaho. I was thinking Boise. I was thinking Boise, yeah. We'd put him up. I know. I, I'd put you on. <laughs> well, hope he at least uh, skirts the town, if not go, goes through it. I think there's a good chance. But, you know, Bo Boise is one of those words you'd like to see on the page. I think every time I see Boise on the page, it's like Coshocton. I want to see Coshocton, Ohio on, on, on the page. So, yeah, I mean, in addition to, you know, I gave a, read, a lecture at Boise a few years ago. It was wonderful. I loved it. Just loved going there. Never thought I would ever go. You know, again, kid from Mississippi, how am I ever going to wake up in Boise? But I did. It was great. Well, we'll hope you come back. Oh, it's I hope I do, too. It's been Thank so you. nice to talk with Real you. Real pleasure, Marcia. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to Pulitzer Prize winning author Richard Ford. Our conversation took place at the 2015 Sun Valley Writers Conference. My thanks to the organizers of that conference for allowing us to interview some of their speakers, including Mr. Ford. For more information, including past dialogues from the Sun Valley Writers Conference, check out the Dialogue website. Just go to IdahoPTV.org and click on Dialogue. For Dialogue, I'm Marsha Franklin. Thanks for tuning in. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Check out our website, become a friend on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter.